Well, I'm going to say good evening. The sun is setting over here. Um, when I was assigned this position, I was a little disappointed figuring to be the last person, but that seems like there's still some attention left here, so that'd be good. Um, in retrospect, it's actually fun because I've heard all these different things, and we must all realize right now that um, the switch to sustainability is going to be very, very complicated. And I have bad news because this paper shows it's going to be even more complicated than we think. So um, we'll have to go there. But then, the, fortunately, the end, there is actually a positive message. So we'll go through that. So um, this is about M87. And it's about M87 because in the last couple of years, I ended up in a strange place um, where I actually spent a lot of time interacting with M87. And M87 is the Maritime Highway for um, that leaves New York City and goes north. It goes parallel to I-87, which is the interstate. And uh, through some mysterious um, error by the Maritime Administration, um, it's unclear whether M87 also includes the Erie Canal, which is shown in this picture over here. And uh, normally when you have highways that run east-west, they have an even number. And over here, it's still designated M87. They say M90 is actually Lake Ontario, um, which doesn't make any sense either, but we'll live with that. We'll call all this M87. If you look at it, um, and, and many people are not that familiar with the Erie Canal. Now, first of all, you know, the Hudson River is, is ocean navigable to Albany. And then you can go north from there and you follow the Champlain Canal. You can actually get into Lake Champlain. And once you're in Lake Champlain, you can actually cut through the border of Canada and end up in the St. Lawrence River too. There's actually a tremendous amount of interconnectivity that exists in this maritime highway system, uh, especially in our area of the uh, of the United States. And uh, it's uh, also very apparent when, uh, when you become aware of the fact that the Erie Canal also has two side, uh, side canals, the Cayuga Seneca Canal and the Oswego Canal. And the Oswego Canal lets you go into Lake Ontario because the Erie Canal is designed to go into Lake Erie, obviously. So uh, the history of um, uh, Hudson River, M87, is that um, it's kind of a really unique river. It's a river that flows both ways and actually it makes an estuary. It actually is tidal all, all the way up to Albany. And uh, when Henry Hudson showed up, he, um, he, um, he had good news, bad news. He was looking for a way to, uh, to China and that didn't work. But when he got home, he, uh, to the Dutch especially, he goes, you know, good news, bad news, bad news is I didn't find China. Good news is, man, that's nice real estate. There's some really good stuff there. There's a river you can float up and down. There is, the climate is really good. There's not too many rocks like in New England. There's not too much malaria like in Virginia. It was really the sweet spot. And actually, it gets much bigger. I mean, it's easy to find, too, because you're actually New York Harbor is in the New York Bight, right? So you sail the parallel. You start to see land on one or the other side and sail north or east and you go into New York City. So um, it became um, in 1825, which, by the way, used so it was 18, 1823 or 1823. Uh, oh, 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 yeah, good. Okay, so 1825, um, the uh, the Erie Canal was opened and it it exploded the um, the um, the trade, which was already very big. I mean, the Hudson River trade was very very large, but then they built the Erie Canal and exploded it, and then they built other canals, uh, which of which we still have some of them, and um, we actually are dealing with a massive economic corridor. Now what happened, of course, the railroads came in and all of this started, started to become a little wobbly. And in 1959, they built the St. Lawrence Seaway and that was basically the end of the commercial part of the Erie Canal. And then something weird happened because normally when you have the, um, you have the uh, trade change from a, a canal trade to railroads, the, um, the railroads take over and the canal trade dies and then the, the city that had, had this canal trade dies too. But New York City didn't die. And the reason New York City didn't die is because around the same time containerization came in and New York City became a major container port, which already had railroad connections and allowed cargo distribution without the Erie Canal. Now, the Erie Canal by the 70s only had one purpose. It was an open sewer, which actually is significant. You'll see in a minute why. The picture, uh, you can't see too much of it, but um, I think I have another picture. Let me go to the next one. But that was the transportation, was slow transportation originally horse pulled that thing or a mule pulled the, those barges. People sat on it, but it was still remarkable. The trip from the trip from Buffalo to New York was much, much faster than it would have been if you were to do it with a horse and carriage. But that's a better picture. There were more canals. If you look at that, I just want to show it real quick. There were many more canals. There was the Carthage Canal and there was a canal that went to Binghamton and they tried to get the Olean to Olean, whatever, uh, too. You can see that uh, it covered pretty much all of um, 
New York State, except the um, except the Adirondacks and the Adirondacks, even even the Adirondacks had some ways to get the lumber into the system. So the last gasp of the classic New York uh, uh, New York City Hudson River trade, which especially with steam vessels, started with the um, with the Claremont with Robert Fulton ship was the Alexander Hamilton, which was decommissioned in 1971. That was the last gasp of a massive, massive Hudson River, River trade. And um, as I said, it, um, it's basically shut down. But the fun part is that uh, Pete Seeger at the same time showed up and said, you know, let's do something about this open sewer. And they cleaned up the Hudson River, cleaned up the canals. There's a lot of stuff got done. And the, um, the reality now is that there's very little commercial traffic. It still has one significant function, and it's a snowbird highway. And what it is is that the Canadian recreational boaters will get in the Erie Canal, go down the Erie Canal, and take the mast down, especially the sailors, of course, and go down the Erie Canal and go down the Hudson River, and then go outside and start to go to the Virgin Islands or wherever they want to go. Um, the commerce and trade that developed along the Erie Canal has disappeared. I mean, it's really generally very depressed, and it's remarkable how empty that area is. The moment you go past the Palisades, the traffic goes down a lot. The, um, uh, the nature starts to really uh, show up. And it's in many places, the Hudson River is truly stunning. I mean, especially the Hudson River, but even the, and Lake Champlain is stunning. These canals by themselves are very nice too. Many parts of the canals actually follow the rivers, the Hudson River and the, get to me, huh? Mohawk. Thank you, Mohawk River. <laughs> um, so um, there have been many efforts of revitalization that have taken account that New York State is a, a massive uh, uh, commercial and, and, and wealthy point in the, in the tip of the state. But the rest of the state is very, very, very rural and uh, generally quite poor, too. Many towns say if only we can have a prison, we'll do better than we do now because it provides, um, provides uh, employment. So um, in that whole context, um, they started, the maritime administration started to build the marine highways concept. And they said, you know, we should revitalize these, these rivers and these canals and all these things, whether it's the Mississippi or Columbia River, all these things. And they tried various things. Now, this has been going on for a while. I, I would say it started around 2000 when the discussion really started to take off. And, and on the Hudson River, they um, started a program where they were running container barges from Albany to Port Newark. They figured that makes sense, doesn't it? We have a, this river here. We put uh, containers on barges and tow them on a regular schedule to um, Port Newark, and then they offload them and go right in the ships. Um, this was a large barge, a large tug, and it ran for two years, and it never really took off. And there are very interesting reasons why it doesn't work, and I'm limiting it time so i'll go it's in the paper but i'll go on and maybe get back to it so besides that marine highway concept now of course you feel the real pressure and say we want to build sustainable marine highways i mean we want to get rid of all this you know internal combustion and fossil fuels and we want to make it sustainable well first of all here's a picture of what it looks like um uh, there, there's two boats on the bottom there's a, the sloop there that is the clear water which is pete seeger's boat pete seeger really uh, drove the cleaning up of the of the Hudson Estuary very much. The other boat is Aberration. I'll talk about it in a minute. That boat is tied up in uh, right there in the Virgin, which is on Lake Champlain. Uh, I ran my boat from New Jersey to Lake Champlain through the canals and up in Virgin. If you look closely, you see the beautiful waterfall in the background there. Um, Lake Champlain is truly, truly beautiful. The upper um, left-hand picture is part of the Erie Canal. Um, again, you know, you just came out of a lock. If you look very really close, you see aberration is tied up over there. And, and I want to emphasize the beauty of this place. And that's uh, the painting on the right is, a, uh, is what is called the Hudson River School painting, which was a very major art movement in the United States. Actually the first unique American art movement that, uh, that had international acclaim. So there have been very many efforts at trying to make this work. And the upper right-hand picture, you look very closely, shows a barge, a tank barge coming out of one of the locks. Um, there is no active tank, tank barge trade on the Erie Canal, but that was a tank barge that was built in Cleveland and was destined for New York City, brand new. They built three of them, and they were actually sized for the Erie Canal so they could get them to New York, the New York City area. Um, they, the upper left hand is a picture from up high. That looks very nice, doesn't it? Looks very nice. There's a little park there and everything. That's Amsterdam. Again, it shows aberration tied up in Amsterdam. There's a nice dock on the waterfront. It's the worst developed waterfront um, uh, facility I've ever seen in my life. I mean, it, it poured a huge amount of money and it's pretty, but it's pointless. 
And the pointlessness relates to the town that's sitting next to it, which is the picture there, and literally it's empty. It's not always that way. Schenectady, which is very close, has one of the finest colonial um, areas. It's called the Stockade. It is absolutely beautifully preserved. It's as good as Newport, Rhode Island, or any of the other famous places. And um, But they don't have a good way to tie up. This is an interesting boat. It's a blount vessel, blount cruises. It is the Grant Marine, I think it's called. And this vessel is specifically designed to take passengers up and down the Erie Canal. So it has a, a, a it has mast that can lower. I even think the wheelhouse uh, goes down too, to make to to make the air draft clearances, which is rather limited. I think it's 15 feet, and it shows the type of cruise that they would do. Now this operation shut down in COVID and is no longer running, and um, it's no longer running because the Blount family, um, I think the people that were running kind of were ready to retire. Retired. I haven't found any buyers. The equipment is in its last part of its life, but. It's an actual operation that ran for a number of years and in its own way made money. There are other places that still try to do things around the Erie Canal. And you notice I'm talking about recreational right now. And I feel very strongly that when we talk about sustainability and maritime, it is a continuum. It's anywhere from recreational, and Steve already talks about it, find a recreational boat carries some cargo on it, all the way to the largest ocean, ocean going ships. And there'll never be a single solution. There'll always be these hybrid solutions for all these things that we're going to try to do. And over here, we'll start to see more unique solutions as far as the canal is concerned. And then we have trimarans that cross in high-speed service. That makes sense to me. And then there might be wooden vessels built in Costa Rica for their own reason. We'll have this happening. And we'll also have very bad um, um, uh, catharsis where we might be going along on something, building something, and a new technology comes in and says, well, that was a waste of time because now a new technology covers this much more uh, efficiently. And we have to keep all these things in mind. And that is what this paper is about. So um, uh, on the area, in Europe, of course, canal cruising is a huge, big deal. I mean, in France and in England and in Holland, of course, too, and even you know, Rhine cruises in Germany. Uh, in, in the United States, the only canal cruise out there that's out here is near Rochester, New York, and they run these boats that you see right there. Um, they have a diesel engine in them, and they go slow, which is fun. You can't go fast in the canal anyway. And they have done a wonderful marketing job. They have six boats or seven boats. And um, I, when I talked to them in the, for preparing this paper, they said, we're sold out every year. And the question is, well, you know, who are the people that do it? And their website is very funny because the website says it's the history buff, the Foodie, the wine enthusiast, the beer lover, the village shoppers, the engineering fans, the outdoorsies, the unplugged kids, and the hipsters. Those are the kind of people who enjoy going on one of these slow canal cruises, which is very funny because the only thing I don't do much is shopping, but the beer and the wine and everything looks really good. I, I, by the way, I've chartered one of these boats. They were operating out of Troy, and I ran one to Champlain, and I had the same uh, feeling that why is why aren't people doing this? I mean, it's just really fun. It's very, very relaxing. It's a lot of fun. It's much more relaxing than European canal boating because there's no traffic. <laughs> and and the, the lock keeper is happy to see it. So we think we can do all this stuff. And 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 it's true, but there's a huge but. And the but is this. Um, there were studies done by New York, uh, and NYSERDA, which is New York something, something in the energy research development agency. And they said, well, what do we carry um, um, cargo from Pomona packing to Hunts Point, which is the, the major uh, New York City food distribution center? And what do we do it by boat? And they, they ran the numbers, and it turns out that doing it by boat doesn't save you much energy at all. And, 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 and the problem is that, of course, you have a longer route, it's so much slower. You, 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 you know, you say people live on board and stuff like that. And, um, and it, 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 the, um, the, you still have an endpoint movement to the cargo port and all these things where you really do a top to bottom analysis, it doesn't work out. And then when you consider that there might be electric trucks coming out, it doesn't make any sense at all to go by marine. So the question is, do we really need to focus on cargo or marine cargo along this M87 corridor? And the truth of the matter is, yes, we still do but not to move cargo from Pomona to Hunts Point, but maybe to move cargo from Albany to Hunts Point, or maybe to move cargo between Buffalo and Albany. So you, you have to keep thinking that we're working along this corridor. 
And that also means if you want to do that, if you want to develop a cor corridor, in other words, you want to put more trade and commerce and things like that around that corridor, uh, corridor. And that's a problem. And, and um, but not a terrible problem, but it's still a problem. And there's two reasons why it's a problem and not a terrible problem. If you do a picture like this of the Rhine, and it's in the paper, I think, you can see that the Rhine is just really populated. I mean, you got Rotterdam and you keep going up the river there. There's all this industry. And the Rhine River, of course, is extremely busy. And it is a horrible river because it always has a current against you, two and a half knots current against you. And it's really curvy. I mean, it's very difficult to navigate compared to the Hudson, which is literally straight, straight run. So um, there is not a lot of population there, but the flip side to it is actually much prettier than the Rhine. So even though the Rhine has Cologne and all these big cathedrals and stuff, it is from a nature point of view, it's absolutely astonishing. So because we have these differences, we need to, again, always look at little pieces as to how we can put these little pieces to work. And um, the question is, you know, that you may have might have gone too fast, but I think I nailed it. So, uh, well, there's the advantage, of course, waterways are very inexpensive to maintain, which is a really good thing to do. We know that. But the big problem with, that we ran into is we lost our entrance and exit ramps to this M87. And Stephen has discussed this already about all the ports and all these, these things. They need to be developed. The funny thing is they don't need to be developed with huge, big dollars, but they need to become uh, more aware. And you need to get these things to work together. And the advantage of waterways, of course, is over roads is that you can Tom Sawyer it. You can go really clunky. You can't go 25 miles per hour on the highway with a solar powered car or something. You know, you can't pull that off. But on a boat, you can still go five miles or three miles per hour and figure out how you can do it. So um, the, the problem is most work on the infrastructure is gone. And what has not been, what has not gone has been separated from the towns by railroads, which is really bizarre here along the Hudson River and along these canals. They build all this infrastructure for marine and then they go, oh, Oh, railroads will just build them into towpaths, basically. So we, in, on the Hudson River, there are literally railroads going on both sides. And the most disturbing thing, actually, is that they are the most the noisiest thing on the river, especially when I run my electric boat. Um, and railroads are very efficient. We shouldn't forget that. And especially a railroad that runs on a level river like the Hudson River, right along it, that never goes up and down. The sizes of these trains are astonishing. I mean, 100 cars, 150 cars are nothing. And uh, but and um, uh, um, as long as the farm products move from upstate along this railroad to New Jersey and the freight the freight railroad is on the west side, then uh, the railroads are much better. But the moment you have to start dropping stuff in Hunts Point, the game changes very, very quickly. So again, you have these little pieces that you can bring in, you can get that to work. But then if you try to do that with a large scale experiment, it's guaranteed not to work because you can't get enough customers to show up to make this large piece of infrastructure work right away. And that's the big conundrum. And this is where these, these container barges failed. They were ready and waiting in Albany to take containers, but the freight forwarders are going, oh yeah, I can put it on the barge there, but, um, oh wait, it's leaving tomorrow. Now I'll just put it on a truck. And they put it in a truck and the next time they forget about it, but that time the, the, the system never develops. So humans are creatures of a habit and we have recreational habits, commercial habits, which I just pointed out. And they're all, they also are, are creatures of habit in the vision of the future. So it's, it's very hard for us to actually imagine a future unless somebody really starts to tell you what the future could be and they start to build that picture. And, and, and there is a way to do that. And that is, it's called in the paper, Baltalal, which stands for build a little, test a little, learn a lot, which is actually a very powerful engineering concept that has been applied a number of times within extremely complex systems. And the best example is the um, Aegis combat system, which was developed by um, Admiral Myers, who actually termed that phrase. And, and let's talk about Baltalol. So uh, the, the, maybe the trick to get this M87 to work is to, to go small. And this is what Stephen, of course, has already been explaining to you guys, but I'm driving home a little harder, is to, to just build stuff and to kind of exercise to get it to work. And there are two examples here. One is Aberration, which is a wheelchair accessible, solar powered hybrid electric catamaran. And the other one is Apollonia. And I will talk about some Apollonia things in a minute, which are really worth discussing. Uh, I'm okay on time? Yeah. How much? 10 minutes? Okay. Um, so, um, um, first of all, uh, Aberration. 
So, um, and, and, and this is part of the weirdness of life. I mean, I own a 50 foot trawler, which is a diesel trawler, wonderful boat, burns two gallons an hour at seven knots. It's really great. Um, but my wife became wheelchair bound and um, that basically kept us from using a trawler. It just was not wheelchair accessible or rolled too much, all kinds of things. So um, um, uh, I am a sailor, um, but um, when I started thinking in terms of building something for my wife in a wheelchair, sailing becomes difficult. And, and there, there's two reasons for it. One, one of them is I wanted to operate the boat by myself. So if I had a sailing catamaran and taking care of my wife in a wheelchair, it wasn't going to work. So um, it became pretty evident that it should be a power catamaran. And so I designed this uh, electric power catamaran. It's a conversion from a 35 foot sailing catamaran, uh, which is very difficult to do because um, you're always dealing with weight constraints. So the weight engineering was very interesting. And it has a backup diesel generator because it has to deal with range anxiety. Um, I did that willfully. It's a very cheap diesel generator. It's a German piece of crap. It's called a um, Fisher Panda. And um, the moment the moment methanol comes around, I'll just take the thing out. Actually, I have the block and tackle. I can throw it over the side with. Um, uh, you know, but but the the thing is that this fits in build a little, test a little, learn a lot concept. I mean, I built this thing in a way that you can kind of take things apart and see see how it works and doesn't work. And there were things that didn't work, which we will, won't go into over here. But the fun thing about this is that when I started running up and down the Hudson River and the Erie Canal and the Champlain Canal is that you want to use that generator as little as possible. So you start to poke around, you start to plan, and you start to think. And there's a moment, oh, the sun's shining, I'm generating electricity, that's great. And then the next day, it's, you know, the wind is in your teeth and there's no sun at all. And you wonder, should I start the generator? Or should I really run the batteries to nothing and hope that I find shore power at the next stop? And if I don't find shore power, I'll run the generator at night to charge the batteries. And it became actually what I call an M87 test bed. And the point is that you can talk all you want about these things, but if you don't go out there and start to actually exercise it, you never learn the things that you really need to learn to make this work. So, um, it, it, um, you know, first of all, if you, um, if you run this boat with no rush, there's no CO2 emissions. I mean, it, it, that um, three kilowatt, I, mean, I have four kilowatt solar, three kilowatt, they will still do four knots, four and a half knots. So. Um, you know, especially on the Erie Canal, that's actually fast enough. Because canals, you can't run fast, and of course, everybody spends the same amount of time in the locks anyway. And then shore power makes a difference on my boat. And, and the, um, the, the fun part was when we ran up the Erie Canal, I was playing this conundrum, oh, should I start the generator or not? You know, it's a sunny day and this and that. But every time we stopped, it turned out to be a shore power. So when we ran back, I knew where the shore power was. We actually never stopped of the generator running from Little Falls down to Waterford, which is about 80 miles. And um, we were just running, playing, running stereo, cooking on an electric stove and all that stuff. Stay at night, even run the generator, the uh, air condition a little bit to get the uh, to get the swampiness out of the boat. And, and we ran all the way to Waterford on electric alone. So that then makes you think, well, wait a second, we need to make these canals all electric and how are we going to make them all electric? Now, in concept, anybody will say, well, yeah, duh, you can make canals electric, but you don't know until you actually play the game. And that is the bizarre part. You really have to just actually Stephen nodding because we'll get to Apollonia, it's the same thing. So the trick is let's make all these canals electric because that'd be really quiet, be really fun. And, um, and, and it will actually make the canals more fun because you don't have to worry about you know, smell and noise and all kinds of things. And you want to take advantage of the available power. And this is something that kind of also kind of screws in my head. Um, you know, these, these canals have uh, have locks. And we, to build a lock, you need to have a dam. And there's water runs over the dam. And there's a couple of big uh, big drops. And the big drops, they have power plants, small power plants. Um, the, the first lock has, um, I think, a 12-foot drop or 16-foot drop. And they actually build a power plant the day that they built the canal. That is a hydro plant. But the smaller drops, they don't put in the hydro plants because in those days, you needed a guy to move the handles and oil the thing and stuff, and that made it expensive. But new, newer technology, especially with remote control, can make it so much more fun to put hydro uh, plants in these uh, at these smaller dams, too. Now, some people might say, yeah, but we don't always have enough water to run these things. But the fun part is to say, yeah, that's true. But when the water is there, you're generating carbon-free electricity. So you're actually putting stuff in the in the bank 
that you can use for whatever you want to use at the time, or whether it's charging my electric canal boat or whether I have excess uh, water and I make hydrogen or methanol or whatever, it doesn't make any difference. So the trick is to engage it, to engage it at a low cost and to keep pushing along. So Apollonia, um, Apollonia has been discussed, um, but I, I cannot overemphasize how weird an experiment is, the weirdness that occurs just by simply by doing it. And um, the bizarre our thing is that actually sailing a boat up and down the Hudson River, and these guys sail. Um, I think how many how many gallons of diesel they burn this year? Five or eight? Yeah, and, and, yeah. Sam Merritt, the, the skipper, he literally waits for the last moment to, to bring the boat into the dock, and yeah, it's like. And, and the funniest thing is the funniest thing is that it's a diesel engine, so it's a big diesel too. So you have to heat it up. It never runs full speed. It's always idling. So inherently, it's even very inefficient. So you put a bunch of batteries in there with an electric drive motor. You actually have a beautiful model, which they're not quite getting to because there's a lack of money. And then a cargo shows up, and um, I, I mentioned already the engine part, but there's some of the cargo that they have in there. It's really it's really interesting. And it gets really interesting for the reason is that it's a community involvement thing. You see, this is the this is the, the electric bike that I use to carry cargo up the hill. And the Hudson generally is up the hill. I mean, you get the Hudson, you have to go up the hill. It's hard work. Um, and as I said, it already is becoming organic where people come to the dock. Oh, the Apollonia is here. Let me get my, stay there. I'll get my Tesla and we'll load it up and drive it up the hill with the Tesla. So you have this very organic thing. And that organic thing is very powerful. And here's another good example. It was a real problem tying up in New York City, but occasionally there are people that try to do something independent and that say, why don't we have a barge on the water when we can do aquaculture or look at the fish or do whatever? And Apollonia shows up and why can't we tie up? And every time they tie up, it's a party. And um, one of the things that Apollonia makes money with is called boat boxes, which uh, I like to call crap in a box. And 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 it's it's a box that has honey or preserves or cheese or whatever stuff they bring from upstate New York, you know, buy the box and you pick it up. Well, picking up the box is kind of fun, actually. And as a matter of fact, one time I used my daughter's um, a troller, a, a troll I shared my daughter, to go from New Jersey to Bayonne to pick up the boat box, you know, and it became a problem. And um, these these things, this, this waterfront culture is extremely, extremely important. If you don't have a waterfront culture, you don't get people to come along and to decide that they want this, that this is what they want. This is how they want to live. These are the things that are interesting. And it's actually something that's occurring at the moment. It's really starting to pick up, especially in New York City and especially in places like Red Hook, which is culturally just really interesting. So um, I think already covered these things. It's not the car, though, it's the community. The moment you build a community, you start to get more. For example, waterfront markets were a really big deal in along the Hudson River. And now if you're the Apollonia, you show up and you put your honey and your preserves out there, people are gonna walk up and buy it. And these are the kind of things you can do when you actually build these kind of small projects, volatile projects. You need that. So the question is how does it grow? You have to do everything, partly organically, partly by marketing, partly by getting port facilities, partly by community support, partly by unexpected opportunities. Things occur that you truly don't expect. And there's dozens with Apollonia. And actually, it probably dozens with my boat too. Partly by adjusting as needing partly by finding solutions in the field. In other words, you kind of force your way into a certain marina and a marine operator goes, what are you doing here? And you kind of slowly explain it and they kind of, you know, I don't care, go ahead. Um, and, and all by just doing it, keep doing it. And the keep doing it is the most important part. The world is littered with valid experiments, even on the Erie Canal. The Erie Canal, um, uh, uh, the Erie Canal Authority has built electric boats. But they built a boat, they run it for a couple of weeks, and then they put it ashore and they forget about it. The trick is to keep pushing that subject, and they don't do that. So the next steps, and uh, um, provide each Hudson River town with a public dock, uh, focus recreational market in Europe. And I'm, I'm, I think I have a picture of that. Um, the reason I say that is because there's tourism. We live here, the people that live here, we look at this as, ah, it is, oh, yeah, you know, we know everything about it. Well, the thing, the fact of the matter is my, Family has a camp in the Adirondacks. The camp in the Adirondacks sense, like 20 bedrooms and 12 bathrooms type things. And I hate it because I'm the guy who always had to maintain it. And 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 the place, uh, we would always get in our car, put the hammer down, drive I-87, 
drive as fast as you can to camp and then show up over there and have a good time, admittedly, except after I fixed all the screens and leveled the camp and all these things. But the funny thing is, we did. I never appreciated what exists between New Jersey, which is south of Manhattan, driving past the refineries, driving at a turnpike, driving a parkway, driving 87, even the throughway, which is pretty, but I never appreciated what exists between these two places. We live in a huge natural park, an absolutely huge natural park, which extends from the Hudson Canyon to whale watching off here in New Jersey. Um, you know, you can leave from Manhattan and go whale watching up the Hudson River, you know, Long Island Sound, all these massive, huge natural park, which when we get the right concepts together and we get better electric votes, we'll actually become better because there's less noise, less wakes, and all kind of good things. And um, the reason I'm saying focus market in Europe, because this is actually a marketing pitch. It says, come to New York City, greatest city in the world, and then spend a week decompressing, going up the Hudson River, going up the Erie Canal, going on Lake to Lake Champlain and things like that. And you don't want to do that in a, in a way that makes it, um, that, that, you know, that makes it uncomfortable for people. You want to charge a lot of money for it. Um, for, well, this is um, Jeff Upmark's design for a cargo ship, which I won't go into the vision yet, but this is a really bad sketch. It's um, a, an enlargement of aberration. It's 80 feet, and you, do this, you see the six squares there. Those are basically six state rooms. They will have their own, um, uh, their own, um, their own bathrooms. And um, it is a boat for a high luxury, six state room, all electric, solar powered canal cruise boat. That um, that when you run the numbers is actually um, economically viable if you take into account that there are people that are running schooners in Maine economically viably and and uh, fancy sailboats or yachts in the Caribbean too. Now there's one thing we have to remember. These are these are the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with this. It's a really big deal, but it's also a weird fraud. And the reason it's a weird fraud is because there's only one thing that really counts, and that is item seven, affordable and clean energy. Once you get affordable and clean energy running, all the other sustainable development goals will be alleviated because affordable energy reduces poverty. Affordable energy reduces hunger. Affordable energy, especially if it's clean energy, increases health. So all these other sustainable de development goals are actually, they're actually, um, they're subordinate to to the uh, to the uh, to the clean sustainable energy part, and that is a really big deal that we have to keep in mind. So the trick is, what we do is we have to focus on 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 getting sustainable energy to run, whichever way it is, whether we're pushing a sailboat on, on wind or whether we're capturing the overflow of the dams in the Erie Canal. We just have to get that sustainable energy to run by hook or by crook, and when we do that, we will actually fix a lot of things and. As you can see that in sustainable energy, these are all ball to wall things, they're all small things. Whether we're doing um, the Epilonia, whether we're doing the transatlantic, whether we do um, uh, you know, uh, different kinds of sales on larger vessels in your case, or whether you know, all these all these things are all there. And, um, and, and it comes down to just simply doing it. So M87 is an excellent test bet for ball to wall. It just works out that way. There are other places where you don't really get the chance to mess around as much and to have as many variables that you can play with. Um, keep in mind, maritime trade has always been organic. Okay, Henry Hudson showed up over here. There was no, there was no government that showed up and said, "Let's do all these things." It's organic. It starts to develop, and and and, and we have to go back to the organic approach. It's multi-customer situation, and we have to bite the bullet on losses every now and then. And if you can do it in a in a fun way, it gets to be even more fun. Um, there's sustainability it can only be achieved by the proper fossil fuel taxes, which is the real truth. I mean, there's no, well, if you want to fix sustainability, just tax fossil fuels, fuels to the cost of the CO2 that they produce. Um, or you can do it with changing public perceptions, which is really what we're trying to do over here. Um, the, 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 well, that one can be achieved by offering quality of life benefits. And this is why I want your honey to go by sale. And, and also by subsidies and incentive, incentives in the switch to sustainability, which we're seeing with solar on the roof. And quality of life can be as simple as reduced environmental noise and as complex as the emotional trade-offs between pumpkins delivered with or without the use of fossil fuels, because pumpkins basically are thrown away, right? Who, who carves a pump, pumpkin and keeps it? Now, the ideal model is this, that is outlaw gas, gasoline leaf flows, which is a curse in society, leaf flows. 
And there's another approach is that battery leaf flows exist today that outperform gasoline leaf flows. So you can only get contractors to understand that you buy a battery and leaf flow and you charge the pile of batteries in your truck for, for, for your trip. And instead of walking around with a gas can and trying to get the damn thing to start, they actually swap out a battery and you're blowing around. And I have a leaf blower that's every, every bit as good as a gasoline leaf, the leaf blower makes a quarter, if you want to put it that way, of the noise. And it's not irritating noise because it's not high pitched mining from the gasoline engine. Nobody can predict what will work in the future, but it can only be done by doing. And remember that loop speed is central to UDA. I don't know if anybody knows what UDA stands for. If you don't, yes, UDA is your Air Force, so you might have heard in the Air Force, right? Uh, really, Air Force has adopted it constantly because they hated it, actually. It was the Marines that actually picked no, it up. They do it now? Yeah. Well, no, but UDA is very important. And UDA is very interesting also, actually, in naval architecture. And I've written papers about it. So it's orient, um, um, uh, no, observe, orient, decide, and act. And what it means is that if you're a fighter pilot, and uh, you take off in a, in, a, in a jet and you're ready to go fight and another jet shows up and you start shooting, you go, ah! and you freeze and you don't have a solution. And Boyd, who developed this, says, no, you have to focus on, you know, observe, see what's going on, orient, uh, see what your situation is, uh, decide based on that situation and act. And the one that is gonna win the, the fight is the one that can go through that cycle the fastest. The faster you go through that cycle, the fact that you will you will beat the other guy. And it actually in, in fighter pilot training is very important. But if you think about it, it exists in naval architecture too. And it exists in naval architecture in beating the other customer. And it exists in naval architecture in designing ships that can actually respond to a certain situation. So if I have a super tanker, my my act period is a very long cycle, right? Because I turn the wheel over and it takes forever. So I have to focus and orient, observe and decide. I have to really predict the future very far. If I am a lobster boat captain in Maine and, my, uh, and I'm in the fog and I'm trying to find my way home, I don't have radar, that means that my observe and, 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 and orient parts have to take a lot of power because my boat's maneuver. I don't have to worry about the side and act, but the orient part is related to stopping the engine, listening outside to the kind of noise you have. Oh, there's the waves, there's the bell buoy, I make my way in. So in, in, in ship design, that UDA concept is actually very important. Um, um, the, 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 all, the whole code comes down to speed, so I won't go through every detail, but the last line is important. It is the CO2. Reduce CO2 first, whatever you do, and try to fit in as many of the other sustainable development goals as possible, which goes back to that United Nations picture. So that's it. Thank you.